we really enjoyed the conversations yesterday. As a lot of us have talked, it was very different uh, from what we've done in other symposiums. Um, but I really think um, all of our speakers did a wonderful job of setting the stage of all the different issues that we face um, clinically uh, in terms of patients, families, and clinicians trying to help out of the wide variety of symptoms and challenges and triumphs and successes that people can have. So today we're gonna shift gears and start going topic by topic of a lot of the different things that affect us in day-to-day -day life. And we're gonna start um, with a discussion of management of neuropathic pain, which I have to say from our speakers yesterday and from the informal conversations I've had with, with many of you and, and with my own patients is a common issue amongst these disorders. So Dr. Ram Narayan, uh, who did his fellowship uh, in Dallas at University of Texas and then uh, was a trader and left us and now runs a program uh, at the Barrow Neurological Institute, when invited to speak uh, today, um, this conflicted with travels that he had, uh, but despite that, he agreed to join us, uh, or, um, regardless of the conflict, uh, all the way from India. Um, so he is traveling and seeing family, and Ram, what time is it where you are right now? You're, you're muted, unmute, because it's... it's 9.30 in the night. 9.30 at night. Okay, so that's, so we should have done this at one this afternoon and really had the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it really gives me uh, a great privilege uh, to introduce Ram to talk us through management of neuropathic pain. And so, Ram, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Greenberg. Um, uh, I thank the SRNA for giving me this opportunity. Um, and it was very nice of, of you to accommodate me when I'm traveling and, uh, you know, help match time zones. So I really appreciate this opportunity. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about neuropathic pain and rare neuroimmune disorders. So I do not have any disclosures relevant to this talk. And this is the summary of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, pain in the context of rare neuroimmune disorders. What is neuropathic, what is neuropathic pain indeed? How common is it? Um, what, what are some causes and mechanisms of neuropathic pain? How is this diagnosed? And then the, the meat of the talk is going to be on management. Now, um, this particular audience that I'm addressing, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, you're very familiar with this concept of rare neuroimmune disorders. Um, but amongst all of these that are listed, and plus many more that are not listed, uh, transverse myelitis, and, or any kind of myelopathy for that matter, and neuromyelitis optic, uh, optica spectrum disorders, these are the main disorders that result in many times debilitating refractory pain, neuropathic pain. Now, um, when I was looking up this literature on, okay, so um, how is this different from, you know, an, a, another immune mediated condition that I see more often, uh, namely multiple sclerosis, it, it turns out that um, uh, that the, the severity of neuropathic pain and the pain-related disruption in daily life was greater, according to this study that I've just shown up here, and this was published right in the midst of the pandemic. Um, it, was, it was much greater in patients with neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders than in patients with multiple sclerosis. So, and now shifting gears on understanding what causes neuropathic pain. So um, this is something that I learned from Dr. Greenberg when he teaches his patients. So, you know, this, this pain pathway, you, you know, is, is a three wire system. You have a wire, you have, a, you have an axon from the receptor in the skin to the spinal cord. You have a second axon or second nerve that connects this to a center called thalamus in the brain, which is a relay station. And then there is a third wire, which connects that to the highest center in the brain called the cortex. Now, um, in this three wire system, 
there are conditions that can affect the first wire, which is very common in, in conditions called neuropathies, peripheral neuropathies. And what we are going to focus for this talk is disorders that disrupt wire two and three, namely the wire that goes from the spinal cord to the thalamus and the third wire that goes from the thalamus to the cortex. So that's where conditions like multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, stroke, ADEM, all of these conditions affect those two wires. And it is very important for us to realize that neuropathic pain is different in many ways from pain that's caused by inflammation. And by that I mean, so conventionally, what we think of as inflammation is if you get a cut on your skin, you see how that turns red and warm and swollen up. Now that is inflammation on the skin. You can get inflammation in any internal organ as well. So the pain from inflammation is very different from pain that is caused by damage to the nerve itself. And therefore, it has treatment implications as well. It's treated very differently. A study showed that 10% of patients with chronic pain have neuropathic pain characteristics. Now, it's, it's important to realize that 50 million adults in the US have chronic pain. So 10% of that is, is 5 million. So that's a large number. And um, from our day-to-day -day practice, um, we'll be able, we can tell you that this is one of the very challenging conditions uh, to treat, uh, challenging symptoms to treat. Plus, this is something which is very important for one's quality of life. And so, um, and, and, and many times patients have tried many, many options before coming to us. And so um, this is indeed a challenging uh, situation. Many times, I would say several times, we've, you know, it, it's also gratifying when we're able to help uh, patients deal with this. So again, a little more in depth about how this transmission system works. So here are the peripheral nerves that come from the peripheral receptors to the spinal cord. And then you have in the spinal cord are numerous mechanisms that help integrate these impulses, these messages that come from the peripheral nerves and they send it to the higher centers of the brain. In one such center called the pons is where these signals are modulated and then they are sent up to certain other centers called the amygdala and the limbic cortex, which is responsible for the emotional aspect of pain. So we're going to talk about some medications which uh, we use to treat neuropathic pain. And interestingly, these are also medications we use to treat conditions like depression. So it is, it's, it's, it's quite intuitive to, to presume that pain and emotional pathways are very intricately related. And then, of course, the last, uh, the highest center is the somatosensory cortex, as I've mentioned here. Now, what are some characters of what are some characteristics of neuropathic pain? So when a patient comes to my clinic and says, well, I have I have NMO and I also have pain. How do I how do I know? How do I um, conclude that the pain is very likely from NMO and not from another condition like, let's say, a peripheral neuropathy or, you know, from an inflammatory condition? So um, we look at patterns of pain. So if you look at this on the left, you see that there are numerous patterns of pain that uh, occur in peripheral neuropathies. One such common condition that we see in patients with multiple sclerosis is a condition called trigeminal neuralgia. It's part, it, it's, it's one of the main symptoms in multiple sclerosis. Um, not so common with most other rare neuroimmune disorders. Now, talking about the central neuropathic pain, which I've shown here again, so some, you know, someone can get a central neuropathic pain as a result of spinal cord injury. And this is typically what the pattern of uh, uh, the injury, uh, the pattern of pain 
uh, the, the distribution of the neuropathic pain might be. I'm not sure if you can follow my mouse on the, the slide, um, uh, but but I'm, I'm just showing you the top panel on the right, and I'm showing you the middle man where there is uh, a, a spinal cord injury and pain below that level. And then there is in the in the second panel on the right is um, at the is is a pattern of post stroke pain. So if somebody sustains a stroke, particularly of the thalamus, then a few weeks later they end up with refractory pain on the opposite side of the body. And then of course many times what we see in clinic is a mixed pattern of central pain, um, where there is a combined distribution of those that are observed in a spinal cord injury plus those that are observed in a stroke. So it, it more or less a combined pattern. So when a patient comes to my clinic, obviously, you know, we, we, get, a, we get a good history to, to understand the characters of the neuropathic pain. So, so to understand the characteristics of the pain and decide if this is, you know, if this fits a pattern. Also, very importantly, we try to understand how much disruption has it cost in, in their quality of life. And of course, we try to find out what options they've tried. This is something which takes quite a bit of time. We, we, we quiz them on names of various medications that they've been prescribed and the dosages, etc. And sometimes patients find it frustrating to answer that question as well. But that's very important for us to document that and make a decision on what to do subsequently. Now, after this, when we conclude that, well, okay, this is a patient that might possibly have neuropathic pain, we examine the patient to confirm this, and then we may or may not. So at this point, this is good enough for us to proceed with treatment, but sometimes we may need to do additional confirmatory tests like those that are listed on the right. Um, a very common test that, that I find useful is um, a sweat test a quantitative sweat test that's sometimes helpful to uh, um, to to, to uh, corroborate with neuropathic pain. This is the reason is there are fibers that uh, carry pain that also result in uh, the sweating function. So they, there is quite a bit of a connection between these. And if I have a question as to whether there is a peripheral nerve problem, like the wire one, is there a problem with that particular nerve as in diabetes, et cetera, for example, I might get a nerve conduction study. Now, typically in patients with the rare neuroimmune disease, uh, disorders that, that, that we are familiarized with, namely NMO or um, a transverse myelitis, a nerve conduction study is expected to be within normal limits. So there are, the, the thrust in management is to emphasize to ourselves and to our patients that a multidisciplinary approach is the more consistent way to go forward. So medications alone or uh, psychotherapy alone or acupuncture alone may not be the, the end of all. It, it is it's very often. It, and, and, and what I find interesting is whether or not I tell patients about this, they end up in a multidisciplinary setup. And I think that's very, very appropriate. Um, a note about medications, and I know uh, this is the thrust of what we offer in our clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, these are, so the first line therapies are medications like amitriptyllin, nortriptyllin, etc., And, um, a note on this would be patients look up these medications when we prescribe this for pain and find that they are antidepressants and, and get upset. Um, and, and, and they tell us, oh, you know, I'm not depressed. I just have pain, refractory pain. So that's what I was alluding to in the earlier part of my talk. These medications have the highest level of evidence, probably out of the other categories, the, probably the most evidence, I would say, to treat pain with neuropathic characteristics. So these are one of these, these medications, medications like amitriptyllin, nortriptyllin are some of the well-studied medications to treat this. 
and of course, anti-epileptic medications. Again, it is important to tell patients that we are treating neuropathic pain and not a seizure problem. Uh, these include medications like Tegradol and Trilaptol. Um, second line treatments include medications like topical lidocaine, capsaicin. Now, I if 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 this is a patient that's been dealing with this for a while, has tried multiple options. I start offering these first line, these second line treatments pretty earlier on. Uh, tramadol is included sometimes in as a second line therapy. It is usually not preferred for first line therapy uh, because of uh, sedative side effects. And then you have third line therapies, which again, I get a little aggressive and I use them earlier on with the first line, second line therapies. These include treatments, treatments like botulinum toxin, mech, um, medications like mexilatine and clonidin, which don't have uh, a great amount of evidence. Uh, but, but yes, there are numerous uh, individual case reports that are published. Uh, cannabinoids, um, I'm going to deal with this separately in a slide. Low-dose low naltrexone, this is an option that is uh, relatively popular. And I found out that these are popular in... Uh, uh, you know, in patient support groups and opioids. Um, give me one second. All right. Now, talking about opioids for neuropathic pain. So I have listed this study, a very important study here that was published in JAMA, which is one of the leading journals. And it is a systematic review, which means that it, it provides the highest level of evidence for, for use of a particular uh, medication. Short-term studies. So this particular paper looked at two kinds of studies. Short-term studies that were completed within six months and intermediate-term studies that were completed over a period of a few years. These short-term studies concluded that um, opioids, the role of opioids is equivocal for the treatment of neuropathic pain. Whereas Intermediate-term studies concluded that opioids indeed have a higher efficacy compared to placebo, which is which surprisingly, which is not really surprising, but they they clearly did mention with a caveat that there were unclear results on quality of life measures. And the paper does the authors do make a note on pro, you know on on giving a caution regarding narcotic overuse and dependence issues. And what we find practically is, so first of all, in, you know, um, we do not, uh, we're not a big fan of prescribing opioids for neuropathic pain, because this is also, at least as first line or second line, um, this is also, the, the, one of the reasons is also that this patient population uh, may also run into problems with cog cognition, uh, bladder control, bowel movements, et cetera. So we use this very cautiously for neuropathic pain. Now, talking about cannabinoids, there are, so when we think of cannabinoids, tetrahydrocannabis, cannabinol is, tetrahydrocannabis is the psychoactive component and cannabidol is the anxiolytic and is thought to have anti-inflammatory neuroprotective properties. The, uh, again, a Cochrane analysis of about 16 studies with about 17, uh, so more than a thousand individuals, 1750 people uh, concluded that the benefits of cannabis-based medicine in chronic neuropathic pain may be outweighed by their potential harm. And so um, 
I do not hesitate to recommend CBD um, um, for, for patients with neuropathic pain, especially when they suffer from other problems like depression or spasticity or neurogenic bladder, all of which are very common in, 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 uh, in rad neuromine disorders. This is the, the paper. This is the paper that was published in 2019. Interestingly, again, uh, I guess this was right before the pandemic. And then there, um, it, 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 it is important. So the authors do, again, mention a word of caution in, the, in interpreting these studies. So non-neuropathic pain types can exist in patients with these disorders like NMO, MS, transverse myelitis, etc. So it is important for us to uh, pay attention to the safety and duration of cannabinoids when prescribed. So I was looking up uh, current ongoing clinical trials. These are some. And the ones that I've boxed are the ones where Sativax, which is uh, a THC product, is used to treat uh, neuropathic pain. And these are uh, these the, the the final conclusions from these studies are yet to come. Now there are many devices that have a very important role in the management of neuropathic pain, be it uh, neurostimulation, transmagnetic stimulation, motor cortex stimulation even deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulators, these being very common, um, and vagal neurostimulators. Now, these are offered at select institutions by select pain management experts in uh, collaboration with a surgeon. Um, last but not least, uh, again, whether we mention this to patients or not, and I think it's very important for, for, for us to educate patients on this, there are numerous other options uh, and different forms of alternative therapies that can be adopted to in, that can be adopted as a complementary measure to conventional uh, means of treating neuropathic pain. One of which includes scrambler therapy. And this was a paper that was published by Maureen Mealy uh, most of uh, most of you who might be familiar with her, um, uh, I had an opportunity to to work at, at Hopkins at the same time she was there as well, and uh, uh, she published a study in neurology in the Neurology Journal, again a very uh, uh, a very coveted journal that clamber therapy improves pain in neuro in neuromyelitis optica. Um, last but not least. Uh, this is also something that I emphasize to patients. It's, it, is, it is definitely worthwhile to pursue options of psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, um, as emotions, thoughts, and behaviors uh, are well connected. Um, in the last few months, I have been getting a few reports from patients where they uh, their 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 blood sample is sent to a lab and we get uh, a, a report on the response of individuals to uh, different kinds of pain medications and i think this is now obviously this is not this this particular testing which we call um, pharmacogenetic testing is not universally available yet and i don't think uh, it's covered by insurance however um um, I think that 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 is the direction where uh, this this particular field of medicine is moving towards is to to cater pain medications based on somebody's response an individual's response uh, to that uh, medication based on their genetic uh, makeup. So I'll conclude my talk here and take questions. Sorry if I exceeded my time. Hi. Um, so it's not specific to the neuropathic pain portion, but just in your portion of the cannabis topic, you mentioned the neurogenic bladder and how it might benefit 
from cannabis use. Have you seen that in any patients? Um, just trying to find other techniques that might assist with neurogenic bladder symptoms. Can you repeat that question? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's specific for the neurogenic bladder portion with the cannabis use. Have you noticed if it helps alleviate symptoms or what kind of things or benefits have you seen or read about, I guess? Definitely, I've, uh, I've seen patients that the, the uh, neuropathic pain, uh, I've seen a, an, a, a benefit on that, plus a benefit on um, spasticity and mood in general. So all of this, I've seen a positive effect on it. Now, this may not work for all patients. Not all patients have access to it. Not all states give equal access to this. Um, and, uh, and, and, and definitely there is a, 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 you know, a problem with affordability. And, uh, but, but when it, it, it is given to the right patient, I think it, it, does, it does work. Thanks. Um, one of my doctors prescribed buprenorphine for me after years of other things, and it's really worked terrifically, and I've never heard anyone mention it in a talk, so I'm wondering why that is. So this is very interesting. Um, uh, I am still learning this, to be honest, because there are numerous times when patients come and tell me that, you know what, this worked or that worked. And uh I, I definitely learned that but when it comes to translating it to another patient we definitely would want to look at research studies and i don't think there are any um large not not that i i, I would still uh, recommend it to a patient and say well you know there was a patient that told me about this particular option um i don't think there is any research you know high quality research behind this but maybe it's worth for you to try this because you've exhausted everything else. So I do tell that every now and then. But ho however, um, I would prefer to first see if any research has been done on that particular medication and then translate it into practice. Um, so thanks for letting me know about that. I'll definitely look this up. As far as I looked this up for this particular top, I, I did not see um, robust evidence for buprenorphine uh, in neuropathic pain. And buprenorphine is also an opioid. So. Yes, hello. My name's Andrea Mitchell from the MOG Project, and I have a question. You were talking about a study with pain and NMO, and I believe that's for aquaporin-4. My question is, are there any plans to have some pain studies with MOG antibody disease? Uh, that's a great question. Um, aquaporin-4, and Dr. Greenberg is right there, so he's the expert on this, but has unique ways of causing neuropathic pain, which MOG may do it, but not to that extent. So we don't see that being a, a major problem with MOG. So I don't, and, and that's point number one. Point number two is there are, there is quite a bit of interest um, in uh, doing high quality studies in MOG per se, in MOG antibody disorders per se. So there are efforts uh, through the NeuroNext team to 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 um, develop a clinical trial in this area, um, but as far as pain itself is concerned, I think that's still a little far out. Hello, my name is Emily Martin, and I have a MOG diagnosis, and I also have a rheumatology. They don't really know what it is. Um, my question is. Uh, both, all, both sets of my physicians, rheumatologist and neurologist, are aware of the different pain I have, but it sort of just hasn't been, it's sort of like just deal with it. I, not rudely. I guess what I'm questioning is, who is, who, is it time to look into a request, a referral to a pain management doctor? I don't want so many chefs in my kitchen, but... Um, my pain is getting a lot worse and to the point where I was self-medicating with over-the-counter and it really upset my whole system. So I guess at what point and to which physician do I request a pain management referral? I think, uh, you know, I'm sorry you're going through this. This is quite a bit of a frustrating situation for a patient. This, uh, you know, getting 
hunted between different doctors or not are not even like or are even trying to understand whom to reach out to i guess anyone should be able to give you a referral uh, to a pain medication doctor this is uh, you know it could be a rheumatologist could be a primary care it could be a neurologist and i think given that you know if if an individual has and this is not uncommon where somebody has a rheumatological problem and a neurological problem i really do think that these are patients will that will have a combined peripheral and central neuropathic pain problem and i i really do think that a pain management i integrated multidisciplinary pain management team is very important great ram thank you very much we really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the rest of your trip and safe travels home when the time comes thanks a lot ram thanks a lot dr gibbs